All right. So what, what is it? It's uh, 10.03. Why not? Well, we're all here on time. So Ken, tell us about your thoughts on this new initiative from our, from our provincial government. Okay, well, um, yeah, I, I, like most of you, saw the, the announcement a few days back, and, uh, and obviously it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a response that the government seems to come up with every once in a while to, to, to improve the situation for, in this case, they say for buyers, they didn't really say much about sellers. Um, the thing that struck me right off the bat is that um you know the these these kind of trends come and go in bc I and mean, we've been doing this for 25 years and i've seen about a half a dozen or eight times where the market completely goes insane and everyone has to buy at least they think they do and mm -hmm. last year part of this year was the same and so these these things aren't permanent though they don't they don't last like forever sometimes the market slows down and once in a blue moon it actually goes down and these, these measures that they're talking about are pretty much designed for a super busy market. They are not designed for a flat market or a declining market. As a matter of fact, they would penalize sellers in a, in a declining market. So, um, you know, as usual, I I'm not sure they've given it a lot of thought and I'm not sure whether or not it's going to make things better or worse. But if you start off with this idea of a rescission period, or they call it a cooling off period, and they make reference to the Real Estate Marketing Development Act, uh, which is the, the act that governs pre-sale pre-sales in BC. So why can a developer, for example, sell sell units that don't exist? The developer doesn't have a building permit, they don't have financing, but they can still sell these units. And that's under this act called REDMA, uh, Real Estate Marketing and Development Act. So that act, if any of have any of you guys here either bought a pre-sale or acted for someone on a pre-sale? Yeah. Okay, so you know then if you buy a pre-sale, uh, you get a copy of the disclosure statement, which can be anywhere from 40 or 50 pages to five or 600 pages, depending on how many amendments they've had. And you get a copy of the signed purchase agreement. And so the, la the latter of those two dates, they usually give it to you at the same time, but if it's the latter receiving the, the, either the disclosure statement or the contract, that's when your seven day rescission period starts. Okay, so that rescission period um, is, 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 is just gives you a period of time of seven days to back out of the deal for any reason or no reason. You can just simply say, no, I've changed my mind. Uh, I've gotten cold feet. I have some other circumstances have come up. So, the, so that's, I think, what the government's talking about here is some kind of rescission period since they've mentioned REDMA a couple of times in their, in their, uh, their uh, press announcements. Now, the difference between REDMA, though, and, and, and what you guys are dealing with, which is one-off purchases where an, an individual seller sells to an individual buyer, um, there's, there's some differences there that don't necessarily line up with a person buying from, say, Boza or Polygon or, you know, Ani or one of the big developers. So, first of all, you know, when, when you guys are doing a deal, it's one buyer and one seller. And if, you know, someone's buying a $2 million house, the seller has a certain amount of wealth and a certain amount of experience and probably so does the buyer. So there's a sort of, unlike a developer situation where there's one person dealing with say Boza, um, this is one person dealing with another person and they're kind of probably in a similar situation. So there's no particular excess bargaining power, excess experience, excess size for one over the other. That's the case with Redma. It's not the case with, with your individual buyer. Um, the other thing about the pre-sales is it's a very, very complicated contract that people sign when they buy a pre-sale. It's custom drafted by the developer's lawyers and it's 99% one-sided. Okay, so it's completely in favor of the developer. There's very little rights or, or any benefit in there to the buyer. Your contract that you guys use on a day-to-day -day basis is about, I'm guessing 65, 45 in favor of the seller. So there's a little bit of advantage to being a seller, not much, uh, unlike the 99.1. So again, you guys are using a different contract as well. Um, nine, nine times out of 10, people don't even read the contract at all. The one, the one that is used with the developers, they just look at the price and, and the amount of uh, parking stall that parking stalls are gonna get. Um, the other thing is you guys have a very small disclosure statement. It's only a few pages long filled out by the seller. 
Um, the, the disclosure statements you see on a pre-sale are can be in, like I said, it literally in the hundreds of pages. Um, so again, that's another difference. So why are with this cooling off period? Well, you still need actual time to read that stuff. And, and if it's a 300, 400 page disclosure statement, that's not something you're gonna do while you're sitting in the office signing the contract. Um, the other thing on the pre-sales is I would say 95% of people who buy a pre-sale do not have their own realtor, which is totally a shame. As far as I'm concerned, you should have a realtor. You should all tell all of your clients when you send out your mailings and your whatever other in information you send to your ongoing clients, if they or their son or their daughter ever buys a pre-sale, you should be involved in it because you can represent them. You're not representing the developer. Most people don't know that and they just use the developer's representative on site. So again, another difference between this cooling off period for under REDMA and this proposed cooling off period for you guys, individual buyers and sellers. Um, and then lastly, the, the closing period. I mean, you, you buy a pre-sale, it could close in a year, two years, three years, four years. And your, the stuff you guys do generally closes in it's usually 30 days, occasionally a little bit longer. So again, considerably more risk buying a pre-sale with a really long closing date. You guys are closing in 30 days, 40 days. Not too much is going to change in that period of time. The market's not going to go south. You know, there's, it's possible, but it's much more likely if you're talking three or four years. So, so really when they talk about, well, there's, there's this thing that's already in place under REDMA. Yeah, there's a reason for that. And those reasons, none of those ones I just mentioned really line up on your individual cases where one buyer is buying from one seller. So that argument for a cooling off period doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and I guess, the, again, we'll have to wait to see what kind of details they come out with. But um, the, 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 the question would, would be, I mean, in, under, the, under REDMA, the, rescission, the right of rescission is only available, of course, to the, to the buyer. Uh, the, the big developers, they fine, we'll, we'll sell the other units to someone else. Now, in this case, it sounds to me like that this cooling off period, again, is going to be specifically for, for, for buyers. And again, you say, okay, well, yeah, it should be for buyers. We didn't, the seller already knows he's selling the property. He doesn't need any, anything to cool off. Although we've had people sell properties in this market this year and they've come back to me and said well can i get out of the deal i i think i i sold too low or i got in this frenzy and we sold the property now i can't really find anything else can we get out of the sale contract so it it's it's not only the the buyers that are under stress it's the sellers are under stress too because most of them have to buy something else so unless they're moving to saskatchewan or alberta they may have an equally hard time buying another property here somewhere in the lower mainland but it sounds to me that the rescission period will be just for buyers. And it probably is going to be seven days because that's the one they have in place with Redma. Um, and I guess then the next question comes up, well, when does that rescission period start? As I said, under Redma, it starts the, on the, la the latter of the two days when you get the disclosure statement or when you get the signed contract. In this case, you, they could make it the same way. They could say, fine, when you get the when you get the contract, you, you've got seven days to say no. Um, and then I guess the, the next question is, would, would, you, would you start your subject conditions running at that period in time, assuming there are any, or would you wait until the, the, the contract is a firm deal and then give the person seven days or 10 days to get his financing, et cetera, et cetera. Developers generally, they start both things running at the same time. So yeah, you got your seven days, but in the meantime, you can also, if you're getting financing or whatever, you can be working on that in the meantime while this rescission clock is running. So I can tell you from our experience, um, a typical pre-sale contract is 25 pages. Disclosure statement can be anywhere from 50 to 500 pages. And we get maybe... I don't know, a certain number of people will come and see us during that rescission period, say, can you go over all this stuff with us, which we do. Um, but I would say probably 90% of people don't ever do that. So the rescission period is just, it's just a waiting period for them to think about it. Nobody seems to go through the contract. Nobody seems to take any, because honestly, a year or two later, when they're talking to us, we're trying to close and there's all kinds of strange things going on from the developer. No one even knows they can do that. So no one has actually read the contract, even though they've had the seven days. So I guess the, you know, the, the question is, they're going, if they do put in a rescission period, 
for say seven days for buyers, um, what consequences is that gonna have in the market for you guys? So essentially, uh, what other rules are they gonna put in place um, to, to compensate for this? For example, in a busy market like this, what's to stop me from going out and making five, six, seven offers? And they, get, they all get accepted. And so, so what? I don't care. I can back out of any of them for no reason. So that, that may be an unintended consequence of someone saying, well, okay, uh, what do I care? I can, I can just buy stuff and just back out. And there's no consequences to me. Um, so that, that may be something that, that, that is, uh, that is they, they perhaps haven't thought that through. Um, the, the other issue is, is, um, is, you know, is some protection for the seller. You guys have, say you have an open house on Saturday and you get five people in and, and everybody wants to make an offer and you accept one. And now that guy's got seven days to still say yes or no. What happens to the other four or five buyers who would have bought it? Perhaps they're gone. Um, so again, this is going to have some consequences. Um, the other thing that strikes me is, is this could create a whole bunch more backup offers. So we talked about, I think we talked about backup offers last time or the previous time, um, because people will be aware that, yeah, this isn't necessarily a firm deal because this guy can walk away for any reason. Now, you guys all know that people use subject conditions to walk away. I mean, they shouldn't, but they do. The building inspections, you know, financing, all sorts of stuff. Oh, I can't get it. I can't do it. Oh, there's a problem with the place. Most people don't do that, but some people do. We've had clients who, who make a point of using subject conditions to essentially give them a way out of the contract. Um, but in this case, my guess would be the rescission uh, period will have no, no, no rules at all. There won't be any objective criterion to say, well, why am I backing out? It'll, it'll just be like Redma where you just say, I'm backing out because I feel like it. Um, the way Redma works is if you give them the notice to the developer within the seven days, the contract's dead. Uh, if you don't do anything, you have a valid contract after seven days. So it's not a question you have to, you have to do something to make the contract work. You just have to not do something, which is not rescind. So again, whether they do it the same way, who knows? Um, the, uh, as I say, the, the thing that struck me right off the bat was this is pretty much designed for a super busy market. It's not designed for a normal market. It's certainly not de designed for a declining market because of course, when, when the market does decline and we've gone through a few small declines over the last 25 years in BC, um, sellers typically are, are you know, they're, they're, they want to sell and a buyer of course is looking for a way to get out of the contract. So just the opposite of a rising market where, the seller wants to get out of the contract and the buyer's happy that he made a good deal. So I guess, you know, another thing you'd wonder, well, you know, does, does this become a permanent thing or is, is this kind of, I don't think the government's even thought about a normal market or a declining market and how that would affect sellers because this particular government we have doesn't particularly, they're not exactly pro, pro property owners as far as I can tell. Um, so I don't know, I guess the big question is, will it make it better? Will it make it worse? Uh, you know, right at this point in time, it, it's really anybody's guess. It sounds like they're not going to stop there. They may take a run at no subject offers. They've, they've talked about that a few times, which means that you, you just, the seller would not be allowed to accept an offer which has no subject conditions. Now you guys, and again, a busy market like this, you've all seen multiple offers in order to, to, to get a seller to, to accept, someone says, fine, zero conditions, here's my price, and here we go. Um, you know, is that a good thing? Well, I guess it's a good thing for the seller, not so much for the buyer. Um, I mean, have any of you guys been in no subject offer conditions? Anybody? Yeah. So again, it's pretty stressful for everyone. Um, you know, your people are putting out a lot of money and you're just sort of rolling the dice. Some realtors who are more proactive, they will do some searches, they will do strata, strata document checks in advance. Some of them even do home inspections in advance. And so that when everybody shows up on Saturday, you've already got a certain amount of due diligence done. But after you've gotten outbid two or three times, it sort of gets, it, it wears a bit thin to keep buying home inspections and checking documents in advance only to be outbid. So, you know, whether, whether that's a good idea 
to say you can't make a subject free offer or not. Again, if you think it through, let's say they put that rule in, well, what subjects do we have to have? Does it mean we have to have one subject? Like say title review, that's it. Or do we need a whole list of subjects, the normal stuff you guys always put in? So title review and building inspection and financing and review of bylaws and all sorts of other things. So again, that's something I doubt they've thought through. If we say you can't have a no subject offer, what can you have? So if someone comes along and says, well, I'll make a subject to title review within, uh, within 45 minutes, fine. There goes my subjects, they're gone. So again, the question would be what, what subjects would you mandate? And again, uh, so you take them off, you put the subjects in, you take them off in, in five minutes. There's no rule that says you need two weeks to review the title. You can say I'll review the title in five minutes. So, uh, you know, I, again, that's another one of those things that uh, it sounds good. There's a lot of things the government does that sound good on, on paper, but then you try to put them into, into, into practice. And that's really kind of where the rubber meets the road, that it, it isn't that easy as, as, what, as what you thought. Um, you know, they talked about some other stuff, you know, the so-called bait pricing, where somebody says, you know, the property's worth a million, we're going to advertise it for 950, and everybody can make an offer on Saturday so that we all pile in and get multiple offers. Again, is that, is that something that's a bad thing, a good thing? It only, it only obviously works in a rising market. Otherwise, nobody bothers with this kind of stuff. So again, this whole thing seems to be designed to be dealing with, with a rising market. Uh, the interest rates do start going up, uh, maybe a quarter point, half a point, three quarters of a point. You'll see the market you know, slow down, cool off. Again, then do you still want all these measures in place? Do you still want cooling off periods when the market isn't that hot? Um, so again, these are, these are, this almost sounds like a, you know, the government trying to make some hay here and say, oh, look at this, this is terrible. We got a busy market. On the other hand, they're raking in a fortune on the property transfer tax. So they're, they're sort of disingenuous in the sense of saying, well, you know, we want to protect consumers, but on the other hand, this is a real cash cow. Real estate is a huge part of the BC economy. Um, the, so, you know, this is sort of suite of things that the government's talking about. Again, they sound good on paper, uh, just like the spec tax sounded good on paper. The empty homes tax sounded good on paper. Uh, yeah, these foreign buyers are jack jacking up the real estate prices. And if we just stop them from doing that and penal penalize them, this would be a good thing for everyone. And, and they got a pretty good buy-in buy from all of the people in BC, except at the last moment, instead of saying, yeah, it's foreign buyers we're going to punish, they actually punished everyone because the spec tax and the empty homes tax actually apply to Canadians. They apply to permanent residents. They apply to all of you, which is, which is absurd. Um, the whole point, it, these, these, these taxes were sold on the basis that it was foreign out of Canada people affecting the real estate prices here. So uh, I guess for you guys, let me, let me ask you a question. Obviously, now you can see Vancouver real estate is super low. It's one of the lowest prices in North America. The rents are super low as well. This is all a result of the empty homes tax and the spec tax. So you can see, you're just, you can see that's, of course, I'm being facetious. The prices are super high. The rents are super high. And those two pieces of legislation have done absolutely nothing. So when you say, okay, is the government going to interfere in the sales process here? Are they going to make it better? Are they going to make it worse? They're just going to make it more complicated for you guys and for buyers and sellers. But is it going to do anything? That's really the, the real question. And that, that's something this, this particular government doesn't seem to care about because when they do something and it absolutely has no effect, they just double down. So you, as you probably know, the empty homes tax is up to 3%, started at 1%. And the amount of empty homes turned out to be 2,500 instead of 25,000. So when, they, when the government found out about that, what did they do? Nothing. They just increased the tax. Spec tax is the same thing. It hasn't made anything more affordable. The spec tax is throughout most of British Columbia. Um, there's no more affordable places. The rents aren't any cheaper. And yet the, both taxes are still there. So this situation here of them sort of meddling in the in the buyer seller kind of interaction, you have to wonder to yourself, is this a good thing from you guys' point of view? Is it a good thing from your client's point of view? Is it going to make things more fair or more equitable or not? 
And if part of it is going to depend how they roll it out, what rules they put in place. So if you guys have, you know, you guys talking among yourselves as your office meetings, I assume uh, Michael and, and Doug, you guys will have some kind of uh, feedback that you'll be giving to the board to, to, so they can pass this along to the, to the, to the people making the decisions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, abso absolutely. Everybody has an opinion and, 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 and a voice and they should all use it to, to speak up for themselves. A question, Ken, a question for you on this. Is it something that can be written in a contract and then deleted or not accepted by a seller? In the sense of what? The rescission period. Oh, no. Like, I suspect, like, you can't do that in Radna. I mean, most of these pieces of legislation, what they say is you can't contract out of them. Okay, so in other words, you can write whatever you want in the contract, it just has no effect. So you can't contract out of Redma, for example, and say, there's no rescission period, you're just buying it, it's a firm deal right now. So I would guess they'll do the same thing for this and say, well, no, it, it is what it is, you can do whatever you want, but it's, it's still there. Um, and they do that with a lot of so-called consumer protection legislation. There's Residential Tenancy Act is the same thing. Uh, you have certain rules there and you can put whatever you want in your lease. They just don't have any legal effect. So I doubt it. I doubt it. So can I ask you guys a question who are on the screen here? Anybody, you guys have probably somebody been in these multiple offer situations. You've been in crazy situations where clients are out bid. You've also been on the other side where you've got a seller and he gets way more than he thought. So like, do, does anybody, I mean, that's pretty stressful when you guys are going around getting out bid, out bid, out bid. I mean, do you guys think this would be a good thing to say, okay, there's a cooling off period? Would that, would that do anything? Yeah, I think um, having a mandatory period where you have to, you know, leveling the playing field somewhat and definitely from a buyer's perspective of, well, if you're competing, constantly competing against all cash people, you're always going to be losing. So then you have to go to the team B properties where you, you stand a chance. So if there's a way to level the playing field where you have to have a subject, maybe subject to inspection and it's a 24 hour or something like that. I think from a buyer's perspective, that would be positive. From a seller's perspective, I mean, you hedge, you hedge the non-subject offers against the subject free offers. Um, or sorry, you subject, you hedge ones with subjects against non-subjects and you drive the price up, but you always take the non-subject offer from the seller's perspective. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's two, two ways to it, right? I think there's going to be a lot of, if this goes through, there's going to be a lot of, of deals that go through based on what people's prior reputations are. And I think your own personal reputation is going to start to factor a lot into this. People are going to get known as people that have clients that follow through and people that don't have clients that follow through. Because I think uh, I think what you said at the beginning is going to happen a lot, where there's going to be clients that want to throw three, four offers in, tie places up. There's nothing to stop people from throwing in insane offers that they have no idea or no intention of actually completing on. Um, and it's really going to mess up uh, a lot of the selling tactics. And it's going to, yeah, it's just going to cause a lot of havoc. But I think there's going to be people that get known for, for doing that. And that's going to be... Well, the other thing is, if you have your four offers on Saturday, for example, um, you, you may say, well, uh, you know, we've taken the first one, but maybe the other three want to make or four want to want to make a backup offer because the first guy could back out. And most people don't back out of contracts. But now that you have a, a just basically a free pass for seven days, that may become more common, in which case you guys may be looking, as I said, more backup offers than what you would normally have in a, in a, in a, in a regular uh, your regular practice um so a lot of deals are gonna fall apart because of this um i think a lot of deals are gonna fall apart a lot of people uh, um are not gonna write backup offers and they're gonna go buy other properties and then you're gonna be left uh holding an empty sack at the end of the day but some people will be put in offers and offers and go from one property to another yeah it's gonna be a disaster I also feel like it's infringing on your right to sell your own property. Like, where is that coming into play where you're now being told how you can sell your own property and how you can accept an offer like on every level? Like, I feel like that is a really huge factor to this 
you know, with a developer, I feel like it's a little bit different, but our personal rights on how we sell our property and what offers we choose to accept and how, right? Well, that's a very good point. I mean, developers are in the business of doing that. Presumably your seller is just a regular person who wants to sell their house. And that's what I was saying earlier. Is it going to make it easier or worse? But your point is, well, also, there's something called freedom of contract. Um, if, if I want to sell you my car and you want to buy my car, we just do it. Is there some rules about how we have to do it? And, and do I have to have, you have to have a mechanical inspection of my car first and then on and on and on. This is the same thing for a house. Real estate's obviously way more expensive, but again, the, the, the trend in society is that there's more and more and more regulations, more and more um, restraints on your ability to, to say this thing called freedom of contract. Um, there's more and more rules around that saying, no, you can't just sell your house for what you want. You can't just do this. You can't just do can't. that. Yeah. Hello, Michael. Like, what if, like, what if two private people want to sell their homes to each other? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, how do they have to follow the same rules? And if they don't, then we're almost encouraging people to not be an agent because if they just do it on their own, then they don't have to abide by this, this rule. And they can just Ken, I think we froze out for a second. Um, um, so, I think I think that the topic that we're on is. Is, is can the government dictate how we how we sell our properties? Well, they're already dictating that we have to live in them, and we did, and we and we and we we've got to rent them out if if we don't live in them for six months. Um, Doug and I were talking about just like uh, uh, Vadim and uh, I forget who else who else was talking uh, Elena um, that there's going to be people making multiple multiple offers. And then seeing what what kind of deal they can get, and then canceling the other ones, and 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 inflicting harm on the sellers. Chris, well, that that's what I'm worried about. I mean, because we're in a seller's market here, it's harder to buy. And how many sellers do we have where they've had to kind of make a purchase so that they could secure where their next home is going to be, and then they're relying on the sale to pay for that next purchase. And, you know, if we're just getting people who back out all the time, how are they supposed to rely on that? And that's, that's the, the big issue that I'm going to have with this whole thing. Yeah, like a massive uh, train wreck do domino effect of collapse deals. Exactly. And well, I think, Chris, you kind of hit something there because then you're going to have a seller who needs to be a buyer and they're going to put all these offers out expecting their home to sell. But if their home doesn't sell, they're going to, rescind all their offers and, and go through the same hoop again till they get an offer that they can accept on their home. Well, yeah, it's just going to trickle down and down and down. I think it's going to take months. It's a, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's happening now. It's people will put in offers on two or three places and they'll just wait to see what the best deal they have. So this whole rescission thing, that's basically in your condition and subject removal period. So anybody can walk away. So I still don't get how they're, this cooling off period, the cooling off period is when your subjects are due. Well, yes and no. The, the law around subject removal, though, is, is, is that you should make your best efforts to remove subjects. So in other words, if you have financing, for example, and you, you simply say, well, I don't have financing. I went to the bank. They didn't turn me down, but I'm just going to say they did. That technically is, is, is offside. That's, that's if the other side was able to somehow find that out. Um, they could they could sue you for for damages. So you do when you make a subject condition, you have to act reasonably and try to remove it. A rescission period, though, you can just say no for any reason. I just changed my mind. I put in five offers. I know I'm only going to buy one. I'm just going to cancel the other four. Now you don't have to tell the seller that. Unfortunately, you say, well, this is a legitimate offer. Here it is. It's maybe it's even extra high. And the seller could have sold to one of those other people who was a legitimate buyer who actually wanted to buy the place and wasn't just playing the system. So, I mean, that, that could be an un unintended consequence of this. And then let's say you have a backup offer and, and now you've accepted the backup offer. There's still another rescission period, presumably on the backup offer now. So, I mean, this just sort of pushes the, pushes the closing into the future, makes it a little bit tougher for the seller because you're right. Most sellers, what are you going to do? I'm going to buy another place. It's not like I'm just going out of the market and disappearing. I've got to buy something else. And, and I've found right now sellers are, 
I think one of the reasons sellers are reluctant to put their place on the market is just for that reason. <laughs> what am I going to buy? And what's the timing? I just sold my place. Now I can't find another one. Or if I don't sell my place, then I got to go buy something and then hope that my place sells. So it's really tough already on people. I think if you put this kind of rescission period in without, again, what kind of rules? Does it, do, you, do you have a rule saying you can only put one offer in? You can't put in multiple offers. How would anyone even know that? So as I, say, as I said earlier, guys, that this whole point is, you know, the devil in the details. Well, that's all sounds good. Yeah, yeah, look, there's, there's all these issues. But there's this guy named Jordan Peterson. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a professor at U of T. And he says he made an interesting comment that when you try to fix a system that's already in place, it's way easier to make it worse than it is to make yeah. it better. Like you think you're making it better, but you honestly, half the time, more than half the time, you're making it worse. Is there any way to stop this? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think if all you guys write in and you all put in your feedback and you talk to your clients and say, well, what do you guys think? You know, write into your, to your MLA, uh, you, you, you may get them to back off. I mean, they have backed off the, on, from time to time. Um, the, the thing about I find about the government is many people in the government have no business experience. They're not realtors. They're not real estate lawyers. They're not brokers. They're not bankers. They don't have any background in what you guys are doing. And, but they somehow feel they can make it better. Like we can, we can fix it for you guys. Like we don't know anything about it. We have no competence in anything, but don't worry. We can put in some more rules for you guys and everyone will be happy. So I think for you guys, if you organize and talk to some of the other, I'm sure other uh, real estate uh, brokerages having these kind of discussions now, and you get a concerted voice, maybe even get some of your clients to write in too, it could have, a, it could have an effect on the government. I think it's really important to clarify if they implement that rule, and most likely they will, because so far they've done whatever they proposed. Uh, to clarify that there's only one offer can be placed, um, the offer can be placed only on one property. Because honestly, I was surprised. I remember when we were, we've been reminded from time to time that uh, it's illegal to put at the same time two offers on two different properties. And uh, uh, recently, uh, actually, one of the I guess, newer realtors, he said like, yeah, my clients, if you don't accept us, then he's going to write on some, like he's going to write, we're writing on two properties. So basically he even was open about it. I just was surprised that it's not communicated properly. I thought applied courses uh, made better right now, more strict. So I guess they need to make uh, a point that only one offer on one property. And the secondly, regarding the deposit, that if deposit is done, then there's no, way back well presumably the deposits would still be made after the subject conditions are removed unless of course they do away with the you know whether you can still have no subject offers or not and like i said that's another kettle of a can of worms where well what subjects are you or are you going to make mandate then you're going to say you have to have a home inspection you have to have the review of title you have to have this and have to have that and um, you know that's and, and how long do you have to do that for so I can see someone taking a, all of these, these, these things that are on the table. Um, basically, you can probably get around most of them. Uh, on the other hand, getting around them or not, I mean, as I say, the big question is, is this going to make it a better or worse for your clients? Okay, this is the whole thing. This, that's the way I would focus on it for the government is saying, well, you're thinking, are you fixing a problem that doesn't need fixing? Really, at the end of the day, this is a supply demand thing. There's way more demand than there is supply. And there's always going to be that in the lower mainland. It's just not going to go away because half the world wants to move to the, to the West, to Canada, to the US, to, to, to Australia. There's 6 billion people out there want to move here. You're never going to have, you're never going to be able to build enough. So the idea you're going to fix this, you're not going to fix it. Okay? You're not going to fix it any more than the spec tax fixed prices or affordability or rents. Um, are you going to fix this by, by, by throwing in more rules into how you guys do business? So I, I think it's a harm. I, I don't see the benefit to, to the consumer on either the buy side or the selling side. I mean, for us, we're in a transactional business. We can adapt to it, but, but to put a, to have that for a seller 
to have an offer that can be rescinded and you don't know who that person is that's, that's potentially buying your property and if they have the intent to do it or the, do they have the intent to finding the best deal out of the five offers that they put in and, and elena I, it's i don't think it's i don't think it's illegal i think it's unethical but and i and i just asked doug the same question so i think that's that's where you're going to get people to take advantage of a stupid rule Um, yeah, for sure, it's unethical, but I remember we studied that it's also, you, you, you just cannot do it. You cannot write into properties at the same time. Well, That's, they, they, they um, can do can it. Can? Just buy, the, the thing is, they got to buy two properties. You know what I mean? If they get accepted on both, they're buying two properties. That's yeah. right. Yes. Yes. So. But you, you're talking about, Elena, somebody just arbitrarily going to back out of one deal just to say, well, I couldn't get financing or I didn't like the inspection or whatever. I'm just going to use this to put in two offers or three offers, but I know I'm only going to buy one. That's so right. So really, that's, that's, that's offside. You're, you're really not entitled to do that legally. As I say, there is a, there is a case law that says you uh, have to make reasonable efforts to remove subject conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't, then you, you could be facing a lawsuit. Now, again, does that happen often? No, most times people go, okay, get lost, we'll sell it to somebody else. But again, in a flat market or declining market, that's a different situation. And these rules are specifically for a super busy market. Okay, and if any of you guys have been around for long enough, you'll see the market will slow down. Once in a while, it does go down. So then these rules would make even less sense. But uh, unfortunately, as I say, the trend, guys, is more and more and more government interference. And I hate to say this, but as Canadians, Canadians love the government. They love rules. They love taxes. They love regulations. They think if there's a problem, the government can fix it. And that's pretty rare. Usually the government makes it worse. But you know, this is just Canadian mentality. We, we seem to like governments. Um, and unlike the U.S., if you guys read any of you were old enough to remember Ronald Reagan, he said the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Okay, so that's the way the U.S. looks at government. We look at government like, oh, it's going to help us, it's going to fix us, bail us out, fix all these problems. When This is really an affordability issue and it's also a supply demand. This isn't going to fix supply and demand. This is not going to do anything for that. So the, the, the guy who says, oh, there's a cooling off period. Well, so what? I mean, is that going to mean he's going to buy it for less? Is that means is, is he's, going to, he's going to get a better deal? I don't think so. So the question is really, what, what is this going to accomplish? So I, I, got, I got seven days to think about it. So I put in a super high offer, way more than I wanted to, to because there was 10 people bidding. And now I'm going to think about it for a week. So what? What are you going to do? You, you withdraw your offer. Now you got to go do it again with someone else. You think all the prices went down just because there's a cooling off period? No. So, you, you know, again, you have to ask yourself, well, what is this going to actually accomplish? And for the life of me, I can't figure it out. Right? Other than other than it's going to harm, it's going to harm the consumer. And because you, you said it can, you have to do, you have to give all you have to get get the best effort to remove your subjects, but this is a non reason to remove. I just decided I wanted to rescind. That's right. Period. So I, I can't I can't figure it out for the life of me. And they haven't explained it to us other than they just popped this up. Hey Ken, question. Uh, yeah. How about including a non refundable deposit, something small like five hundred or thousand bucks, and then if you walk away, well, tough luck. Well, that is something that they, if you read the press releases that you guys got on you on the uh, on the email, that is something they said. Okay, could could we put something like that in there? Um, say it was five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks. You walk away for no reason, but you leave that on the table. Um, that's exactly. something they had contemplated. Again, I'm not sure that would that would that would be a big enough incentive. And what would that amount be? If you make it too high, then you're basically saying, well, you can't really back out. You're not going to leave five grand on the table every time you back out. On the other hand, if you make it too small, it's irrelevant. So that that's a good point. But you know, again, that's something that's in their press release as as a possibility. Had to feed that cat, Ken. 
<laughs> oh no, that's my phone. Sorry, that wasn't a cat. That's my cats are in the background here. But um, so yeah, so I, as I say, guys, I, I honestly I agree with Michael. I don't see that it's going to fix anything or help anybody or make anybody feel better about anything. But again, that's up to you guys to throw in some feedback to the through your through through your organization. You're, you guys are pretty organized. The real estate industry, you may have some effect. And if you also have your clients phone in uh, or write in or whatever, make some some comments that that probably will have more more effect as well is there is there a case study on this was it done in manitoba for at the top of my head something's telling me it was i don't i'm not aware of that if, if, if it was michael but again manitoba's market in this market is is somewhat different in terms no. of you know how busy it is and, and how, how how the prices have been so resilient but they say if yeah if you if you look at any type of intervention you, the question is what is it going to do what is the effect of this intervention is it going to make it easier so like i said if i'm a buyer and i threw in an offer now i got seven days to think about it so what so i, I withdraw my offer I'm, I'm back to square one but in essence can that that's really sort of who's going to benefit here vice being forced to be make reasonable grounds to remove a condition they can just simply say no thanks and there, there's zero um so really it's it's the buyers kind of going to benefit on this so, and it, isn't that what the press is saying it's it's you know the buyers are panicking and buying isn't that maybe what the government's thinking that we have to you know maybe buyers are getting in too deep is that do you think that's what they're thinking that we got to slow down the buyers vice the market well, it, that could be, but right now that there's way more demand than there is supply. So, I mean, when you say you're going to so, slow down the buyers, well, there's already way too many buyers out there now. And the fact is that if you want to give someone seven days to think about it after they've got an accepted offer, what, what advantage does it give the buyer to say, okay, yeah, you know, I kind of screwed up. I shouldn't buy this. Okay. I pull my offer. Well, where am I? I'm back to square one. So if you want to buy, and that's why, why you made the offer in the first place. You've just undone your, your deal. You've Maybe you've outbid a few other people and you've had your realtor do a lot of work and make an offer, get it accepted, and now you back out. Well, you're back to square one. So I would think your realtor, was after a couple of those, is going to just kiss you off and say, look, you're just wasting my time. We, 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 we researched the market. We found a place for you. We made an offer. Now you just pulled out on it. So I think in a way, I just, I just off the top of my head, I don't see buyers really benefiting a lot from this. The fact is we're all, we all kind of go with the herd. And when everybody gets panicked and they all think we better buy, we better buy, this is all COVID driven because the interest rates have gone down. People have also realized that, you know, they can spread out, they can work from home, they can go live in Langley or Abbotsford and, and you know, work remotely half the time or more. So it's pushed the prices up all over the place. It's not just Vancouver. Actually, Langley is super hot right now. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what you can buy in Langley for a million bucks, basically nothing. So, you know, you're so again, the fact of, like I said, there's all these buyers out there um, allowing them the ability to back out. I don't think it's going to fix the problem. Because they're going to back out and they just right back in the, the same problem again. Let's go find another place and bid against three or four other people. Yeah, I think so as you say, you, you analyze what is the, the government is really good at saying we're going to fix something. Okay, well, are you? That's my point. Is, is it going to make anything better for anybody? It's certainly not going to help the sellers. But is it even going to make something life easier for the buyers? Uh, question? Oh, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I think people are likely to go more fast and loose with their pricing because they're going to say, well, I was pre-approved up to 600. I know I'm not going to get it. Throw in my offer at 680. Now I have seven days to, to try to get my financing. If it doesn't work out, then just run away. And so I think people will just because, I mean, they have their pre-approvals. Now they have to stick pretty close to it. But if they don't have it, there's nothing to stop them from just throwing it in because they can put in any number they want. I was wondering if um, okay. if there's any way to have an effect, like you said, we might be able to have an effect on the outcome. Oh. <laughs> I'm on a Zoom. Oh. Is this going to like happen no matter what, or is there a way to stop it? 
Well, well I think if you guys mount a, a, a response to the government that they might, they might rethink it. I think it coming from the real estate industry, coming from consumers as well. And, and as I said, the way I'd analyze it is, it, what is it going to fix? Like, really? Like, what is it going to fix? Most people, I mean, I've had the odd person in a rising market come back to us and say, as a buyer, I'd like to get out of this deal. I think I, I, I think I pulled the trigger too soon. It's pretty rare, though. And usually a year later, they're, they're pinching themselves saying, geez, I'm glad I didn't back out because the property's up 15%. And now I couldn't afford to buy it today. So it, it's really, you know, like, uh, that's right. Buyers are, are kind of pushed into this and they all feel right now, if they don't buy something, they're going to be priced out of the market. This has happened at least half a dozen or eight times since we've been practicing back 25 years. Uh, these, these kind of crazy situations come up, but they don't last forever. They, then things, they flatten out and every once in a while they go down for a bit. That's just a market we're in. People want to live in the lower mainland. It's just, it is what it is. So when they stop that, then we're all in trouble because then the whole, the whole society has gone down the drain. But for the time being, I don't see that changing. So my, my kind of general thought on this is, what is this going to fix? Did, didn't we just have an election? <laughs> yeah, we did. But we need a different government because this particular government, being the NDP and the socialist government, they are not pro-property. They are not pro-property owners. So this is, this is part of the... Part of the reason we this this may be a more interference with your your selling and buying process because they're not pro property in the first place, but I you know as I said I think you you've got a big problem here with supply and demand you're never going to catch up with the with the uh, the demand and so is this going to fix anything I doubt it but you know I guess it remains to be seen uh, I think they're going to put it in they, they they've announced it it's more or less of how are we going to put it in and what additional things are going to put in but some of the stuff you guys raised they should know about it you know should someone be allowed to make five offers should someone you know back out of all these different offers and, and with no consequences at all like you can do with the pre-sale um so again should it, it may be if they're going to do it for sure you may want to put in some some feedback okay well we should put in some extra rules or some extra kind of parameters in terms of how how people can do this and as I say, you're, someone made a comment earlier about just your, your freedom to make a decision, how to sell your own property. Again, this is just one more restriction on your ability to, to own and sell property. So uh, as I say, unfortunately, the trend is going that way. And, and maybe, maybe if there's enough uh, pushback, it, it, won't, it won't happen. Who knows? Um, a question. Is it a sort of a permanent move that you're thinking about or just a period that they have in mind, like, I don't know, six months or something? Well, these things, uh, Viviana, they seem to never go away. Uh, you know, even the, the sort of the, the, the short-term stuff seems to stick around. Mm. And as I say, if you look at the spec tax and the empty home tax, both complete 100% utter failures. They're, the prices are no lower, the affordability is no better, rents are no lower for both of those taxes, done nothing. And are they taking them out? Are they putting, are they scrapping them? No, they've just created two giant bureaucracies. They just created another bureaucracy called the Landowner Transparency Registry. Another completely useless registry, which employs many, many people and costs a ton of money and is going to accomplish nothing. Is it going to go away? No. Maybe if the government goes away, a new government might take some of these things out. But there's a general rule that once something's in, it takes like an atomic bomb to ever get it out. It's like daylight savings times. We're back here. We are rolling the clock back again. I thought everybody voted the other way last year. So just something even that simple, can you get rid of it? It, it takes a lot. So if they put these changes in, I, I would think they're going to be permanent. And another problem that might arise is, especially with first-time buyers, that they are already insecure about what they're doing. And they think that they are uh, kind of having more options. But as a matter of fact, it will make their life even more miserable because at that point, whatever could be, could, you know, kind of fuel insecurity. So they will keep doing this trick over and over again. And we are in a position in which if you kind of stop them, 
you lose the client. So you have to like educate them not to get that way, this whole kind of situation, I guess. Well, how it's going to play out, I guess you guys will see it on the ground because you'll be the ones dealing with it. But um, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty major change. If you look at the cooling off period, maybe no subject offers. They also talked about blind bidding so that, you know, if I put a second offer in somehow, you know, you have to tell the, you have to tell me what the other offers are. That was another thing on the table we didn't talk about, but that's uh, something else in their press release that presumably would handcuff the seller and say, okay, we've got to disclose all these other offers and how much they were. And so uh, again, is that going to help anyone? I don't know. I, I sort of doubt it. So, I mean, this system has run this way for a lot of years. And the question is by meddling with it, are you going to fix it? Or are you going to make it worse? And if you look at the government's track record, it's pretty, pretty likely it'll be worse. But uh, like I said, you guys are on the ground. You have a good perspective on things. You have a the, the hands-on experience, the government has none. So it could be that if you, Michael, you guys get together with some other brokerages and, you know, get a concerted effort and get, a, you know, a nice letter back in and a lot of, lot of support, uh, it, it could have some effect. Yeah, I just, while we're talking, I just sent a note to, uh, to Reba, Real Estate Brokers Association. I used to be the president. Um, now Rob Green is. So I sent him a note of what's going on. So they're discussing it as we speak too. So, and they and they have a direct line to uh, BCREA and the board. So it would be good to hear what, what they have to say. Because I can't, for the life of me, I can't see or have I read anything that is for this. And, and it's all about the customer and I get it, but I don't see how the customer is going to benefit from this. So if anybody finds an article that's pro, send it to me. I'd, I'd, I'd like to read it. Yeah. Um, I think, Ken, I think yeah, that was a really, really great discussion. Um, I think everybody appreciated, uh, again, your time for this. Um, like I said, guys, if you need a real estate lawyer, I would always recommend, I would always recommend, um, sorry. I would always recommend a lawyer to for your customer and Ken's probably the best one in the city that I know of so thank you again Ken for this uh anybody have any final questions or can we let Ken go uh what's up Elena I have a question but a bit off topic but it came up actually twice from different clients uh, past weekend um they start us uh actually made the rule to not allowed to the gym unless they are vaccinated do you think uh, they have a say in it i know it's kind of a weird question but still i sent them to actually ken you suggested once to one of my clients um a real estate lawyer who deals with stratus so i sent them that information um but just um, if you have any on this topic I don't, Elena, and, and when something is super specialized into a strata issue for just specifically strata law, I will refer your client to a, a lawyer who just does strata, strata okay. properties. Um, they probably don't do real estate, but they, if it's a strata issue about bylaws or some kind of restriction like that, um, that's who you, that's who your client wants to see, and, and we'll okay. make sure they see them. So anyway, guys, well, it was nice chatting with all of you. I, I hope this thing works out okay, but uh, I, I wouldn't just necessarily uh, let it sit. I think you should make, make some concerted effort and you guys all collectively would have hundreds, if not thousands of clients. Maybe when you're chatting with them, it's a good, a good reason to phone them up. Say, hey, how, how are you guys doing? You know, you guys always, it's always good to call your clients and, and you know, this is just have a discussion with them. So that's just, the best takeaway right there, guys, is engage engage the customer see what they say they probably yeah, don't you, they probably you go back to the board and say that you can say well we talk to all our clients we, we have hundreds of clients thousands of clients what do they think they don't know it i'll guarantee you that mm -hmm. but it's a good reason for you guys to call them up and say hey do you know what's going to happen here and by the way they may say well yeah i'm thinking of selling my house because you know i haven't heard from you for a couple of years now it's nice chatting with you you're giving me some information that i didn't know about uh, because this is big, big news for you guys and us, because we pay attention to this stuff. But I wouldn't say maybe one in one in 50 clients even knows about this. 
So it's a good reason for you guys to phone up your client and have a chat. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ken. And and, Thank you. and Thank guys, you. It's, it's been it's been an hour. So why don't we just sign off on here? Um, if you need Doug and I, just uh, reach out. Remember, Thursday's a holiday. Um, office will be closed, but uh, we're always available on the phone. So stay well. Okay. Thanks, guys.